Radio's own show, Behind the Mic. Radio, with a switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. But there are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the comedy, and information that are behind the mic. And now with Graham McNamee in Washington in preparation for the broadcasting of tomorrow's inauguration ceremonies, Behind the Mic will be carried on this afternoon by the genial master of ceremonies of one of radio's newest programs, Your Happy Birthday. And now here he is, Tiny Ruffner. Thank you, Gilbert Martin, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this afternoon, we first take you behind the scenes of NBC's hookup for the broadcast of the inaugural ceremonies from Washington, D.C., then an audition of two singers for a possible sustaining spot on the NBC Blue Network. More humorous mistakes your favorite announcers made on the air. A salute to an old favorite program, The Man from Cooks, with Malcolm LaProd. And finally, a powerful human interest story behind radio's oldest dramatic show still on the air, Death Valley Days. Tomorrow will mark an historic occasion. For the first time in the history of the United States, a president will be inaugurated for a third term. This afternoon, we give you the pre-inauguration behind the mic scene. We take you to Washington to the various points from which the description of the inauguration will be broadcast to the United States and to most of the rest of the world to show you the radio hookup being tested. All so that tomorrow's important program can be brought to you with technical perfection. And now we take you to Washington for these tests where first you will hear the voice of Behind the Mic's regular master of ceremonies, Graham McNamee. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. NBC's core of 40 engineers, announcers, commentators, and news observers are this afternoon preparing for the radio coverage of the third inauguration of President Roosevelt. More than 24 microphones have been installed in observation booths along the streets of the nation's capital. Other mics are in Army bombers, in Army scout cars, in the tip of the Washington Monument, in the Capitol Dome, in the inaugural stands, at the White House. Let's listen to NBC's men and women behind the mic getting ready for the inauguration. Let's listen to the engineers at work. Whoop, test, one, two, three, four. Here's some pigs. Whoop, 60. Whoop, 60. Whoop, 40. Whoop, 60. Whoop, 100. Whoop, 80. One, two, three, four, test. Here's some more pigs. Whoop, 60. Whoa, 80. Whoa, 80. And covering the Capitol will be Carlton Smith, the presidential announcer. What do you see, Carlton? I see the focal point of the nation's spotlight, the inaugural stand at the United States Capitol building, where tomorrow a new governmental administration is begun. John Nance Garner, present vice president, retiring from public service after 38 years in Washington, will administer the oath to Henry Agard Wallace. And the 79-year-old Chief Justice of the United States will, for the third time, swear in Franklin D. Roosevelt as President of the United States. Here the drama takes place. Here will be 100,000 persons watching and listening. From here, NBC will send its word picture to its tens of millions of listeners. And at the Treasury Building is Bockage. Come in, Buck. Bockage talking with my two colleagues here from the corner of the Treasury. We're looking down this wonderful sweep of Pennsylvania Avenue. Way down there, I can see the dome of the Capitol floating in this blue haze that is typical of the atmosphere of Washington. Right up here, they'll march tomorrow, and we'll watch them, won't we? Here they come right up to our very feet. Then they swing around to the left, go up 15th Street and make one more turn, then come up to the, the Court of Freedom, where the president will review them. We'll see every one of them. We'll expect to hear from you, too, about those. You know, this is a wonderful spot. It was here that that famous picture was taken when the Union armies marched up this very street. There are buildings over there. The Willard Hotel was there. It's in the picture. You can see it. Sometime, if you look at it. They swung up here, came around, finally were reviewed by President Lincoln up further. And to tomorrow, tomorrow, perhaps this parade that we're going to see is going to be one of the greatest pageants in all history, as great as any of these others. And with Bogage, 
are Patricia Lou Head, age 11, and Townsend Pagter, 10. They'll describe the event tomorrow for the nation's school children from coast to coast, who, of course, will be at their classes on Monday. What will you talk about, Patricia? I will talk about the, the oh. inauguration of the first president who has had three terms. It is also so the first inauguration I have ever seen. Well, you see those, look over there, you see those little boys sitting up in those empty seats in the bleachers? You think they'll be over there tomorrow? No, I certainly don't. Any of your friends up there, do you suppose? Well, I don't believe so, but I hope all of them won't be there tomorrow because I want to describe the parade to them over the radio. <laughs> and you, Townsend? I'm uh, hoping to see tomorrow Franklin D. Roosevelt being inaugurated for his third term. He is the only president ever to be, so far, to be inaugurated for three terms. Well, that makes it very important. <laughs> Incidentally, the entire world will hear this inauguration. It will go out in Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, and German to Central and South America and to Europe. Some 70 stations in South America will rebroadcast the entire inaugural ceremonies. Let's listen to the International Division as we test their mics. Come in, in Italian. Dinanzi al Campidoglio, dove il Presidente degli Stati Uniti presterà duramento per il suo terzo termine in ufficio. Una folla visibile di migliaia di persone ed una invisibile di milioni di gente ascolteranno alla radio in tutto il mondo le sue parole. And now in French. Avant de vous décrire la scène que nous avons sous les yeux, quelques mots sur la portée de l'inauguration. Nous avons tenu à ce que vous soyez présents ici à Washington par l'intermédiaire du micro pour plusieurs raisons. The Portuguese language. Yes, national broadcasting company está apresentando um programa especial, um programa descrevendo essa cerimônia, um programa que está sendo transmitido ao mundo inteiro em seis línguas diferentes, sendo que. Come on in in German. The national broadcasting company bringt Ihnen heute eine Sonderübertragung aus der Bundeshauptstadt Washington anlässlich der Einweihung des Präsidenten Roosevelt zu seinem dritten Amtstermin als Präsident der Vereinigten Staaten. Es ist das erste Mal. And now finally in Spanish. Minutos que nos quedan, quiero repasar rápidamente el programa que tenemos por delante. Primeramente, el vicepresidente saliente John Nance Garner oficiará en el traspaso del cargo y el juramento de su sucesor Henry Arnold. And that's only part of the vast arrangements being completed by NBC to bring you a ringside seat for tomorrow's inauguration, which you will hear over this station beginning at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And now, back to New York to continue with Behind the Mic. Thank you, Graham McNamee and the NBC Special Events Division for making this broadcast possible. And now we present another Behind the Mic first. You are about to hear two singers auditioning for NBC's program board so that they might be considered for a sustaining spot on the Blue Network. But before you hear them, here is Robert E. Button, Assistant Program Manager of NBC's Blue Network to tell you something about this audition. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Button. Tell me, Bob, before singers can appear on a network sustaining program, they have to audition before the program board, isn't that so? Yes, Tony. Well, when do these uh, singers audition? Well, provided any have been presented for audition, we listen to them once a week after the program board's business meeting. Uh, incidentally, what does the program board consist of? Well, Tony, the program board is made up of the manager and assistant manager of the Blue Network and mostly the heads of various departments. Well, Bob, after listening to these singers and provided that the board believes that they have real possibilities, does that secure them a spot on the networks? No, Tiny. However, when there's a spot open for a singer, it means naturally that the approved artist will get consideration. Well, does this entire board decide who will sing on network-sustaining shows? The final decisions are up to the manager of the network. He makes the decisions, decisions himself. Of course, the enthusiastic approval of a singer by the rest of the board would certainly influence the manager in making a decision. Incidentally, Bob, who are these singers who audition for the board? They are, generally speaking, people who have been recommended by the members of the sales force or talent division or other departments of NBC or by members of the boards themselves. If we hear a singer at a nightclub or at a hotel or on a smaller station who seems to have a great deal of talent, such a singer is very often recommended for an audition. In other words, you've got to have a lot on the ball before you get the tryout in the first place. Absolutely. Well, this afternoon, Bob, Behind the Mic is going to present two singers to be considered for sustaining spots on the Blue Network. Now, we're told that the members of the program board will be listening to this broadcast 
and that next week you'll be back here to give us their reactions. Isn't that so? That's right, Tony. Now, ordinarily in an audition for the program board, as I understand it, the singer usually has a piano accompaniment. But since it's behind the mic who's presenting these young ladies, we're going to give them a better break and use a full orchestra. First, we present Miss Jane Clifton, whose lovely voice has been heard on various smaller radio stations in New York, but who has never appeared on NBC before. Miss Clifton will sing, Let's Dream This One Out. It's such a lovely night, swell orchestra, fine crowd, so gay. And now to make it perfect, oh honey, let's slip away. It's been so nice dancing, now how about chancing? A moonlight view, darling. Let's dream this one out. You look so inviting. I put it in writing that I love you so, darling. Let's dream. This one out The music will follow us sweetly Out where the blue shadows start And while the stars wink discreetly We won't be a heartbeat apart And maybe we'll say things those let's name the day things that thrill us through. Let's try it. Let's dream this one out. That music will follow us sweetly out where the blue shadows start. And while the stars wink discreetly, we won't be a happy apart. And maybe we'll say things, but let's name the day things that thrill us through. Let's try this once, let's dream this one out. Behind the mic presents for an audition, Miss Anne Francine, who has been a hit at the Persian Room of the Plaza and at other swanky spots. Miss Francine sings, I Hear a Rhapsody. The rustle of the trees becomes a symphony Every breath you take 
is music to my ears. My darling, hold me tight and whisper to me. Then so through a starry light I'll hear a rhapsody Thank you, Jane Clifton and Anne Fancine. Bob Button will be back next week to tell us on Behind the Mic just what the program board which heard you this afternoon thought of your performances. Behind the Mic salutes a program you loved. We in radio believe that radio has a tradition of which it can well be proud. A tradition of good programs that linger fondly in our memory. And so each week we bring you a star or part of a program you used to hear. A program that you loved. Now this afternoon we salute WJZ's first commercial program, The Man from Cook's. Sponsored by the famous travel agency, Thomas Cook and Son. Written by and featuring Malcolm LaProd. This program started in April 1925 and ran continuously until the spring of 1939. Now with Malcolm LaProd in person, we present a portion of that program, The Man from Cook's. This particular program dates back eight or nine years. Ladies and gentlemen, Malcolm LaProd. <laughs> One of the great attractions of traveling in Europe is this. The complete change of scene adds a new interest to everything you do, even to such routine matters as three meals a day. Now suppose we look over the map of Europe for a few characteristic settings that give special flavor to breakfast, luncheon, and dinner. To the average American, his cup of coffee is the most important breakfast item. And you may have heard that it's impossible to get a good cup of coffee in Europe. Vienna is an outstanding exception to the rule. Good coffee is universal in this historic city, which, after all, introduced coffee drinking to Europe and to America via Europe. This happened more than 250 years ago when the Turkish armies laid siege to Vienna and camped around its walls. Eventually, they were forced to retreat and did it so hurriedly that they left behind them most of their equipment and supplies. Among these were bags of coffee beans, fine Arabian coffee, favorite beverage of those old Turkish generals. Now, a certain Viennese pastry cook got hold of a bag of coffee, and he baked a lot of rolls shaped like crescents. And through the streets of Vienna, he went carrying his tray from door to door, inviting the people to drink the Turkish drink and to eat the Turkish emblem to celebrate victory. Coffee and crescent rolls at a cafe on the Ringstrasse a table on the balcony of your favorite cafe, where you can watch the crowds go by and enjoy the atmosphere of this city, which can never forget that it's the home of the waltz. And when you're there, something of the rhythm of the beautiful Blue Danube gets into your bones, yes, even into your breakfast. Now for luncheon, a luncheon with pictures, let's hop across the map to Belgium, famous for good cookery. 17 miles south of Brussels, on the edge of the field of Waterloo, there's a little tavern where they know how to serve a typical Belgian lunch. And you'll look out over the rolling wheat fields where the most dramatic pitched battle of history was fought 125 years ago. Off to the southwest on a little hill, seated on his white horse, and surrounded by a few staff officers, you will see Napoleon, watching with troubled eyes the heroic efforts of his cavalry to break the British squares. 4,000 men in steel breastplates surging around immovable rocks of infantry. And you'll hear the sound of the bagpipes and you'll see the kilties of the Black Watch rise up and swarm down the hill after the retreating French, hanging to the stirrups of their own Scots greys. You'll have a glimpse into the past, a mighty panorama of action floating over these fields of wheat that are so quiet and peaceful today. Venice is an ideal setting for dinner. Dinner at Florian's on St. Mark's Square, a restaurant that hasn't closed its doors for more than 300 years. Make it a late dinner. With a moonlight view of this square, 
the most harmonious collection of ancient buildings in all the world. The pigeons have all gone to roost now among the domes of St. Mark's Church, except for the clothes of the people who sit at the cafe tables and walk about the square, this picture belongs to a thousand years ago, to the days when the Venetian galleys sailed up the Grand Canal with their cargoes of silks and spices from the east. Dinner in the moonlight on St. Mark's Square. Yes, we all remember those travel hours with the man from Cook's. And we remember how pleasant it was to go to Europe in those days. Do you think it'll ever be the same again, Mr. LaPrade? Yes, I do, Tiny. Nothing can end the romance of travel. Europe will again be Europe. There'll always be an old world. And the man from Cook's to tell us about it, I sincerely hope. Thank you, Malcolm LaPrade, for recreating such a fine program. Oddities in Radio, presenting odd little true behind the mic stories that help make radio sometimes amusing, sometimes exasperating, but always interesting to the people in it. This week's oddity examples of fluffs or mistakes of your favorite announcers, which we presented to you twice before on this program, have been so entertaining that we decided to bring you more of them with some fluffs of other personalities thrown in. A few years ago, Mel Allen, in announcing a comedy program, was supposed to say, Pick and Pat! In pipe smoking time. But it came out like this. Pick and Pat in smike poking time. <laughs> An announcer who will be anonymous in announcing the demise of a United States senator was supposed to say, Today, this famous senator died of septicemia. But he actually said, Today, this famous senator died of skepticism. <laughs> Deems Taylor, in introducing Sigmund Romberg, was supposed to say, Sigmund Romberg is a great Kern fan. Here's what he said. Sigmund Romberg is a great fern can. <laughs> Gabriel Heater, well-known commentator in quoting somebody, was supposed to say, this is a fine state of affairs when we have privately manufactured munitions. But it came out like this. This is a fine state of affairs when we have privately manufactured musicians. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, a former guest of this program, C.J. Ingram, on his own show and in interviewing a movie actress, said... Uh, tell me, Miss So-and-so, what was the dirt of your birth? Now for a real-life story behind the oldest dramatic half-hour program still on the airwaves and now going into its 11th consecutive year. I mean the Pacific Coast Borax Company's Death Valley Days, which dramatizes true stories of the pioneers who settled the Old West, told by people who live in the famous Death Valley section of California today. After one broadcast, a letter was received addressed to the narrator of Death Valley Days, the old ranger. He's the man who tells these stories which are dramatized. And here is Jack McBride in the character of the old ranger to read us the actual letter he received from a woman listener after a broadcast. Ladies and gentlemen, the old ranger. <laughs> and now, old ranger, will you please read us that letter? It was written to me by a woman in Ohio. For obvious reasons, I won't mention her name. It said, Dear Old Ranger... Here is a true life drama that even you have never thought possible. One of your stories saved two lives, my baby's and mine. It was in late summer. One night, my husband left me and my child. He'd done it many times before, sometimes for weeks at a stretch. It was on a Thursday that this happened. I thought we were just in his way and would be better off dead. So I made plans to kill both my baby and me that night. It was just getting dark here when I happened to remember that it was Death Valley Day's time. I hadn't missed a program since it started, so I tuned in and sat down with my little two-year-old boy in my arms. Finally, the story came, and incidentally, Tiny, this ain't in the letter, but I play the part of Pratt in this Death Valley Day story. 
And now the letter goes on. It told of a lady that was running an eating place. For some reason, she had no use for men at all. And as soon as they'd finished eating, she made them clear out. Well, this night, one of them lingered on. He'd offered her a job to go into partnership with him. At first, she didn't want to, but... What's that you said, Pratt? I want you to go along as my partner in the business. Me? Yes. You see, my scheme is to have a combination store and eating place where folks can stop their teams and get outfitted and fed. Yeah? Well, I can run the store part of it, but you see, I, I got to have help with the restaurant. I need somebody who knows how to feed folks and feed them well. Well, somebody just like you. Oh, thank you. And tell me, how come you picked on me instead of somebody else? Well, you're a blame good hasher. Besides, I don't want to run no chance of getting roped in by a woman. <laughs> I was married once. Oh, so you figured you'd be safe with me, huh? Well, I know you like men just about as much as I like women. I hate men, all of them. Well, I don't hold that against you. In fact, I, I look on it as a distinct advantage. A uh, queer partnership we'd make. Oh, you're just the person I want. All business, no sentiment, and a darn fine cook. Uh, well, how about it, Mrs. Preston? I'll do it. And her letter goes on. So they went into business together, and it was just that. It was strictly business. Many years later, a man from the city stopped for lunch. He knew her, but she denied that he did. He'd been the cause of her hating men. When her partner came in, she made the stranger clear out by telling him that she was married to her partner. Then when the stranger left, she turned to her partner and said, I shouldn't have lied like that about our being married, but to see him standing there sneering, I... Well, that's all right. Uh, suppose that feller that was just here should go repeating to folks what you told him, that we was married. Oh, I never thought of that. You know, he struck me as just the kind who would go blathering about. Well, you don't think he really would, do you? Well, he might. You'd hate to be caught in a lie, wouldn't you? By him of all people. Well, then suppose we, uh, suppose we turn the tables on him and get married. Pratt. Hey, after all these years, well, I thought you was a woman hater. Besides, I'm an old woman. Oh, fiddlestick. Well, I'm 59, my next birthday. Well, I'm 62 myself, Mrs. Preston. Well, I... All right. Good. Oh, by the way, uh, if I'm going to marry you, I can't keep on calling you Mrs. Preston. Oh, hardly. Well, what shall I call you then? Well, all my life, I wish somebody would call me baby. What? <laughs> all right, that's fine. And, you know, I'd, I'd like it if you'd call me Bill. Will you? Yeah. Well, um, uh, before we get married, uh, Bill, I yeah. want to tell you about that man who was just here. Oh, you don't need to tell me anything. Well, I said I'd never seen him before, but... That's your story, and you stick to it. Now, come on along, baby. <laughs> well, now the letter concludes... That story, old ranger, put more spunk and pep in me than anything ever done. She didn't let a man lick her, and I made up my mind right there that I wasn't going to let any man lick me either. So with tears, I laughed at what a fool I come near being. And the funny part of it was, my husband came back about midnight that night, and when I told him what I'd almost done, almost killing my boy and me, he promised on his knees never to go away again. We never miss your program. See what it did for us. And that's the actual letter. Yes, Tiny, it is. I have the original letter in my possession. Well, thank you, Old Ranger, for your contribution to our store of interesting true behind the mic stories. Be sure to listen next week when you'll hear the dramatic story behind one of Frank Luther's broadcasts. A salute to an old favorite program. Andy Sinella, his Pennzoil Orchestra, and more of the glamour, the tragedy, and the comedy that are found behind the mic. Graham McNamee will return to this program next Sunday. This is Tiny Ruffner saying good afternoon. This is the National Broadcasting Company.